Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort, and I'm live with Josh Hoffman, uh, co-founder and CEO of Zymergen. Going public today, you're at the NASDAQ. Um, this is such a unique company. It's different from uh, the, the typical either tech or manufacturing company that I'm used to covering. But I, I'm fascinated by what you're developing. And um, we, can, we can even start in the realm of uh, electronics, which is one of your three core markets, to give people a sense of what this is. I mean, uh, do I pronounce it Highline? Highline, yeah. Highline Z2. Um, yeah, Highline, just Highline. Tell, yeah. tell people what that is because I think that'll start to give potential investors and just uh, tech enthusiasts out there a sense for what your technology is capable of. Uh, great. So first, thanks for having me on. Uh, it's obviously a, a big day for the company. Um, I mean, look at Zymergen. We're making better stuff in a better way. And as an example, that Highline product, uh, it's a it's an optical film. So it's a sort of clear film, very thin, uh, that you would use in the display stack, the stack of a, of a cell phone display or a tablet display or a laptop or TV. And what it allows manufacturers of those displays to do is simply make uh, better screens with higher performance and in a whole bunch of interesting form factors. So whether it's a foldable display or a lower power consumption display. And what we're really doing is kind of, we're able to, to partner with nature to bring, as I say, better products made in a better way to market. Uh, and we're excited about the kinds of products our customers in the electronic space are, are gonna, gonna bring to market with our product. And the, the partner with nature part is what is going to be exciting for people to get their heads wrapped around. Um, th this is man this is manufacturing at the molecular level, right? This is manufacturing at the molecular level. I mean, look, um, humans have been, I, we, people I, I think don't always think about this, but humans have been cracking hydrocarbons, taking oil or gas, heating them up, breaking it to component uh, molecules, and then like molecular Legos, reassembling them to make all the stuff that, uh, that, that we touch and feel and use every day. Uh, and it's an incredible triumph of human ingenuity on the one hand. And on the other, uh, we've been using the same basic six or seven Lego blocks uh, for the last hundred years. Uh, innovation has slowed. You do anything for hundred years, you're, you're gonna get good at it. And frankly, the manufacturing methods are, are contributing to the existential problem of our time, which is climate change. Uh, and many of the products that are made have a whole series of uh, problematic end of life uh, implications. So whether you're talking about microplastics that are ending up in our waterways, whether you're talking about uh, runoff from nitrogen fertil fertilizers that are creating dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, whether you're talking about the endocrine disruptors that people have talked about creating a global fertility crisis. And so our ability to kind of tap into you know, billions of years of evolution and make, as I say, uh, better products, right? Products that perform better, products that have features and functions that existing products don't have, and to manufacture them in a more sustainable way. Uh, I mean, that's the point of technology, right? To to support human progress, and we're excited about uh, the potential for our technology. Explain how uh, the algorithms that you work with work together with the biology for you to find the solutions to customer problems and um, kind of what the what the challenge is there uh, in scaling so a, a bit of your secret sauce and how the uh, machine learning ai piece partners together with the biology yeah so um people have been dreaming about using biology for broad-based industrial purposes for a long time amgen uh, the first cover the, f the first thing they did a real technical notice my understanding they were on the cover of science magazine for, uh, for creating the E. coli uh, bacteria that could make indigo dye. But, uh, so the power, the power is easy to understand, right? The imagined world. The problem is that the biology is mystery, right? As one of my co-founders likes to say, what we don't know about biology vastly exceeds what we do know. Even the best studied organisms, we only know a frac what a fraction of the genes do. And so if you actually wanna be able to uh, take this amazing idea and make it a commercial reality, you gotta hit your cost targets, you gotta hit your scale up plans, right? You gotta manufacture, we're a, we're a business. And what we've built is a set of machine learning algorithms that in part allow us to uh, find and identify uh, those 
those genes, those genetic changes that allow us to make these engineered cells to, to have them replace with economics that work, you know, hundreds of, of millions of pounds of steel and concrete and high pressure reactors that is the, the standard chemical manufacturing process, right? And so what we're doing is we're, we're taking advantage of huge revolutions in sequencing and gene editing and cloud computing to allow us to reliably search and program the genomes of our, of our bacteria, these, these, these microscopic chemical factories in a way that allows us frankly to deliver our, deliver our product at pretty exciting costs. Um, let's get into your addressable market. Uh, you know, in the S1, you talk about uh, in a total addressable market in excess of a trillion dollars because you're, talk, you're talking about materials used for potentially anything. But the, the three markets that you're focused in on in the beginning, uh, the, um, the addressable market, I think, is around $150 billion. And so right now, we talked about Highline, but uh, you're also in uh, customer, uh, consumer, consumer care. care. Yep. And, and you're, you got this naturally derived insect protection that's expected to be available in a couple of years. Um, yep. What is that? How is that different from what's out there now? And, um, and what's the potential market impact that you see? Yeah, so, I, I mean, uh, the, the current market for insect repellent products, it, it creates a pretty unfortunate consumer choice. Uh, you can have something that's effective, but is unpleasant to use uh, and doesn't have great safety properties. Or you can use stuff that has got great safety properties and is pleasant to use, but probably isn't very effective. Um, and at a time, especially with climate change, where insect-borne illness is becoming more and more of a, of a real-life problem, right? Ask anybody who deals with Lyme disease uh, in the Northeast or this, the recent scares. I mean, I think the COVID, COVID has taught us that uh, we're not immune to, to the challenges of biology, right? So people have thought about West Nile on the East Coast. People think about dengue in places like Singapore. And so we're really excited about the ability to, again, partner with nature, bring a, a, a product to market that is safe, effective, naturally derived, uh, and that we think is going to change the way people think about uh, what insect repellents are instead of a, an unpleasant necessity to use when you're camping or having a barbecue. We're excited about the potential to create a product that is safe, useful, and pleasant and can be used you know, all the time as part of your everyday care regimen. Um, as I'm thinking about the business itself and how it potentially scales, uh, I wonder about that piece. Because you can do almost anything, right? You have to make choices about how this scales. And I'm not sure how yields work when you're talking biology. How much of that is still to be figured out? And, and how much of your investment is going to have to be in facilities to, uh, to, to, to enable this? Is there the equivalent of, of, of a chip fab that you've essentially got to build for fermentation to facilitate the processes to address these markets? Um, great question. Uh, the short answer is uh, uh, no. Uh, we are able. So, so I, I think the first thing I want to say is that, as you suggested, figuring out scale up and manufacturing has been one of the, the things that has constrained uh, biology's potential to have this broad based industrial application. Part of what we've built is a platform uh, that we believe has really solved that. And, and through the work we've done, for example, with R&D service partners, uh, we really feel like we've demonstrated that. That allows us to then use uh, partners in the contract manufacturing space who can do the fermentation for us, uh, who can do the, uh, the, the the final assembly of the products. And so I, we don't anticipate uh, sinking substantial capital into, into our manufacturing assets. We're really excited about the partnerships we've built with, with contract manufacturers, and we expect to do more of those going forward. Um, at what point are you, do you see yourself being able to uh, serve huge customers on the smartphone scale, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and because, you know, I, I've been to CES and Mobile World Congress a couple of years ago, you know, foldable displays, at least conceptually, were all the rage. Your technology um, fits right in with the zeitgeist, certainly. And, uh, and, and so my question is, so many of these things, whether we're talking about phones, watches, uh, you know, bands that people are wearing around their wrists are being manufactured in the millions per week. Um, when's the technology going to be ready to operate at that sort of scale? Yesterday. 
I mean, oh. <laughs> look, we, we're going public now because our technology is proven. It's validated. We have product in the market. We are, uh, have a super exciting customer pipeline. We're able to, to, to sell into, to meet the market demand that we see it. And, you know, you're right to, to talk about the, the scale of it. This is not a sort of proof of concept. We hope we only sell, you know, into 10 phones. Um, we're, we're going now. Uh, now, you know, we'll have to continue to scale. And we, we certainly hope that uh, we have the kind of commercial success that will uh, mean that we have to continue to, to add capacity. Um, but we're ready to go, right? We're ready to go. Manufacturing is up and running. And, uh, and, and it's important because in the electronic sector, uh, customers won't even seriously qualify you until you're able to demonstrate that you've got both the quality and the volume necessary to serve their customers. And frankly, the fact, just one thing I would say uh, is that we are um, I'm incredibly excited about and proud of the work that our teams did to bring our supply chain up last year during COVID, right? To bring up a physical supply chain for a precision performance product, right? In a time of COVID when you couldn't build factories, I think it speaks to the quality of the execution uh, that the team has. Um, and I think, you know, our customers have been impressed. I mean, we're at, at Touch Taiwan this week. It's the first in-person trade show uh, since COVID. Uh, and the feedback from customers, the feedback from partners there has been incredibly strong. And so, again, you know, in this sense, we're maybe not a typical startup, right? You, you really have to be ready to serve full-scale industrial customers to actually even start having a conversation around the business. Uh, and then finally, we're, we're going to get the opening bell soon. I, I don't want to take too much of your time. you got a busy schedule on your IPO day. But I want to ask you about the future of manufacturing because you're talking biomanufacturing at scale, which is brand new. And we're having this conversation in America right now around um, reclaiming manufacturing around so many different types of areas. Yep. What does the U.S. need to do to lead in the emerging area where Zymergen is focused? I think the U.S. has uh, a huge advantage today in terms of the strength and depth of the investment in basic and applied science across a number of areas. I think the U.S. needs to continue to invest in that. I think that to the extent that we uh, are able to find ways to uh, smooth the capital flows from you know, folks who are used to investing in maybe less technologically advanced forms of manufacturing, get them comfortable with that, that's great. But I actually feel great about uh, the U.S.'s ability to maintain and extend its lead as a, as a center for this kind of distinctive advanced manufacturing. Um, I mean, what we're doing is rooted in, you know, we're based in the Bay Area, right? We are deeply rooted in the work that's happened at Stanford and UCSF and Berkeley, and then a whole bunch of other, you know, uh, research institutions around the country. I, I think that, that that continued investment in foundational science, foundational and applied science is just so, so critical. Um, and so I, I hope that we continue to invest in that. Now, would I love additional support. I think there are other opportunities for additional government support to help build CapEx, to help our manufacturing partners build that plant. That would be great. Um, but I, I generally feel great about where we are. Well, uh, another place you are is at the NASDAQ on your IPO day. Uh, excited Josh Hoffman, co-founder and CEO of Zymergen, to have you come on and, uh, and explain that for Fort Knox and Tech Check and CNBC. Perfect. Thanks very much for having me.